Okay, well, um, thank you all for being here. Thanks to ACS uh, for having us and for hosting this panel. Um, and uh, I would just like to say congratulations to all the student groups who won awards here today. The student groups are the backbone of our organization. And as someone who works very closely with my student group at UCLA, uh, I can say that uh, the student groups who uh, have won these awards uh, are certainly deserving of the honor. The amount of work and effort and time that goes into making those chapters successful is really spectacular. So congratulations to all of you. The, the subject of our panel now is called Meeting the Moment. Um, so many of our panels over the last few days and our discussions in the hallways uh, have focused on the unique legal challenges uh, that we face uh, in our current political and legal environment. We're seeing unprecedented attacks on existing laws that protect consumers, minorities, and uh, uh, access to health care uh, for most people. It's not just that we're seeing good and valuable policies that are being attacked, uh, but that we're seeing the very norms of our democracy that we've relied on for so long for peace and harmony uh, being undermined or at least severely tested. Moreover, the challenges seem at times overwhelming. Today you'll pick up the newspaper and find stories that you weren't even thinking about yesterday and that the scandal you spent all day yesterday thinking about is dropped to page seven of the news because there's so much going on. How do we as lawyers and as law students, um, as judges and law professors, how do we uh, prioritize, how do we respond uh, to this moment? Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the common themes we've seen uh, and about how we can uh, go forward and uh, be effective and valuable advocates for uh, liberal democratic values. Um, uh, I'm, of course, so honored to be up here on the stage with this illustrious uh, group of panelists. Um, uh, just immediately to my left uh, is the wonderful former judge, Nancy Gertner, uh, former federal district court judge appointed by uh, President Bill Clinton and served for 17 years, uh, now teaches uh, at Yale Law School. Uh, Oh, sorry, Harvard Law School. And if you happen, <laughs> you, with that. you should know that Yale still has a page for you saying that you're a professor there. Because so, I, I, That's I, where I my heart is. there you go. Um, but more importantly, if you were watching um, a late night MSNBC this week, you would have seen her on Rachel Maddow really kicking ass. So uh, that was really great. Uh, Ted Shaw has enjoyed a very illustrious career uh, fighting in the legal trenches for civil rights, civil, equal access to education and voting rights. Uh, he formerly served as uh, the director, counsel, and president of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, following in the footsteps of some rather notable lawyers there, too. Uh, and he worked for the NAACP for 26 years, and he's currently a professor at the University of North Carolina and the director of the school's Center for Civil Rights an institution that many of you know is currently undergoing withering attacks by lawmakers in uh, North Carolina who are trying to put it out of business and stop it from representing clients. Um, uh, then we have uh, Ian, uh, Ian Basson, who is a former associate White House counsel under President Obama and the executive director of Protect, Democ Protect Democracy, a newly formed organization that's fighting to preserve government integrity and ethical conduct uh, from the unprecedented onslaught of the current administration. Ian is a former student chapter president, so he comes right from the very uh, ground and soil of the American Constitution Society and should be a model for many of you students thinking about your future. Uh, Ian is the, uh, uh, a good model for you to follow, uh, that you can pursue those progressive causes. Uh, the answer is not always big law. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, we have uh, Palak Shaith, uh, who is the Managing Director of Affirmative Litigation at the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. Uh, she is familiar to many here. Uh, very familiar to many here, um, as she previously worked at the American Constitution Society twice, in fact, two different times. Yeah, you may be in San Francisco, but you're a lifer. We're him, yeah, okay. uh, and uh, of course, uh, last but certainly not least in any context is 
uh, Walter Dellinger, uh, former Solicitor General of the United States uh, and also appointed to President Clinton uh, to his position. Uh, and he's one of the leading Supreme Court and appellate advocates uh, in Washington. And when he argues before the high court, if your timing is just right, you may see him arrive on his 10-speed uh, bicycle, uh, at his preferred method of transportation to uh, the United States Supreme Court. Uh, so thank you to my panelists. Ted, I was hoping to just start right with you. Um, maybe you can offer us some perspective on the moment we are in. What is this moment? You've been through so many fights. You've been through uh, administrations that have taken on civil liberties, that have targeted and, and attacked minorities uh, and uh, immigrants. Um, uh, how is what we're seeing now different from the attacks that, that you've lived through and struggled through in the past? Um, or maybe how is it the same, and sort of what are the lessons that we can bring from those old battles to uh, the moment that we're in today? Well, first, you know, it's always an honor to be here. Uh, I always have a conflict every year because my daughter's birthday is June 9th, and so it's always in a, in a conflict. So I, I drove up from Chapel Hill this morning because I had to be there yesterday, obviously. And I was doing a great deal of thinking on the way up, but I was also listening to my music. And there's a, a song that I love that I suspect almost no one in this room, maybe a handful of people know, it's Curtis Mayfield. And the song is, This Is My Country. And uh, I gain a great deal of, of sustenance inspiration every time I listen to it, as I did this morning. Uh, the time we are in, in my view, is unlike any other. Uh, this is not the Reagan administration. It's not Bush 41 or 43. It's not just a matter of conservatives, uh, because uh, we've lived through conservative administrations, and we've gotten through it. Uh, I was at justice when Ronald Reagan was elected and uh, was there for a little while afterwards before uh, it was clearly time to go. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I thought about, uh, I wrote something um, about six months before uh, the uh, man in the White House was the candidate for the Republican Party and that I just posted. I just felt like I had to do it. And I started off reflecting on when I was 20 years old, reading William Shirey's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And I began to uh, talk about how reading that book then and seeing what was going on now reminded me of the parallels. Um, and I ended it, I won't take the time to go through it all, but I ended it with the comment that this is how it happens. That's the unsettling thought that I was left with. Uh, and that's the thought that I've been left with ever since. Uh, I'm not saying that this is Germany in the 1930s, but my view is that Donald Trump is an existential threat to democracy as we know it. Um, and uh, I'm in great fear for our country and have been for quite some time now. Um, having said all that, uh, you know, I, I think when we talk about how we respond to this moment, which I gather we'll be doing, uh, I'm also conscious of the fact that uh, probably most of us, when we have our stand-up moments, if that phrase makes sense, we don't go looking for them. You know, they they come to us uninvited and we're compelled to stand up. And I think that's where we all are right now. Uh, I don't know how we're going to get through this, but I know that we will because we have to. There are some people who think that this is representative of the beginning of the end for uh, the American Republic. Uh, I don't. I don't believe that, I don't think that, I don't think we can allow ourselves to think that. 
Um, but this is a, a troubling time. Um, and it, it's a time when we have to fight like we never have before. So this is unlike anything that I've ever seen. Nancy, uh, Judge, Judge Gertner, I should call you, please. Judge Nancy is fine. Judge Nancy. That's <laughs> the compromise these days, right? You can call me Judge Adam for no reason, but. Uh, we've seen uh, a real major effort uh, to meet the moments, sort of the, the traditional liberal response is go to court. Like, let's go to court and let's fight Trump in court. And obviously that's going to be an important part of any strategy of resistance against uh, uh, Trump administration and the, this uh, potentially existential threat that uh, we are facing. And in fact, the courts have been a place where there's been some considerable success so far in challenging uh, President Trump with the, uh, the Muslim travel ban. In case, I don't think there's anyone still in doubt that it is a travel ban, right? We've been made clear by the president um, that that's uh, uh, unconstitutional or has been uh, put on hold. Uh, sanctuary cities, the order has been put on hold. So we've had some success. Um, but the question is, are the courts likely to be a successful venue in the long run for these challenges against, uh, against this existential threat? Um, uh, or should we be thinking about um, things outside of litigation? Uh, or, or how should we think about litigation more generally? To, to some degree, <clears throat> after Ted's comments, I think we should be thinking about everything. Yeah. Um, but right. I, I want to, um, uh, in, in one sense, I have to sort of reach back to my Yale Law School days, when uh, uh, I used to kid around about how uh, you know I took sociology of law one through twenty at Yale Law School, um, uh, and that when I took the bar exam, I thought dying intestate was a disease. <laughs> <laughs> I had to mobilize all my resources to be able to become a litigator and then a judge. But the other area of my expertise at Yale Law School, other than sociology of law, was the law of mass arrests. And I somehow feel like I have to pull that file out again. Um, I, the, the courts are obviously a critical locus of resistance here, particularly since all the other checks and balances have softened. Right? You know, it's the checks and balances was the civil service. The checks and balances was the Department of Justice. The checks and balances also in, would include a cabinet that would exercise independent judgment. Um, I have to say that I was worried when Trump was elected on a thousand different grounds, but one was I wasn't sure that the courts were up to the challenge. The, my writing when I left the bench was mostly about how the principal pressure I felt as a judge was to duck, avoid, and evade, was to move the cases to uh, dismiss cases, to get people to settle, to use all sorts of procedural devices to avoid making a substantive decision. That was really the focus of my writing. So I would have not predicted that the bench that I f left would have stepped up to the plate. One of the things about the pressures that I felt was that it was almost as if, particularly in the civil rights area, just using that as a metaphor, it was almost as if you the, the, the doctrines had so narrowed because of the sense that the polity was basically okay, right? That the things were basically working, the market was working, the government was working. In civil rights, you were looking for the aberrant actor. You were looking for the aberrant discriminator who just hadn't gotten the message. Um, and con that context and that approach, I think, helped affect a very narrowing of civil rights and public rights litigation. Then came President Trump. And it was almost as if the judges who had to deal with the travel ban and the judges who had to deal with sanctuary cities and all the cases across the country suddenly had a different context in view. It wasn't that the market was working fine and the government was working fine. It was suddenly you were not just envisioning a slippery slope of abuse which is usually the way the debate happened in, in, uh, in uh, uh, these kinds of cases. What was the slippery slope? This time you could, not, you could see it. This was, these were cases that were being litigated in the context of a president that really meant to overreach and ran the risk of overreaching. And I wonder if that's the explanation for this extraordinary set of decisions with respect to the travel ban and the sanctuary cities. How far will that go? So that's one narrative, which is judges then are dealing with this issue with the notion that you're really the last 
bastion, you're really the last line of defense as against an overreaching executive. That's one narrative. The other narrative, which I worry a little bit about, is the narrative of let's prove to this president and his supporters our neutrality. And so the other narrative is I want to act against type. Uh, that the Supreme Court will show the president that in fact it is neutral by parsing and reversing or making decisions where th that we would not have otherwise expected. This is, not an, an, this is not an exact analogy. It's just something that I thought about. Reminded me a little about what uh, Robert Cover wrote about. He uh, was a Yale professor who wrote about the judges who, northern judges who fiercely opposed the, the fiercely opposed slavery, but who nevertheless enforced the Fugitive Slave Act with a rigor that no one expected, when there were really alternative theories that they could have used to not enforce it. And why did they do that? They did that because they wanted to believe, they wanted to show their neutrality. You see, I believe X, but look, I will do Y. So I'm not sure where the courts will be. On the one hand are those that are envisioning real the potential for real overreach and real abuse. On the other hand is the narrative of, gee, we should show this president who calls me a so-called judge of my neutrality. And the context then could affect the outcome. In all the rest of the areas that judges are going to have to deal with, uh, the, one of the other panels was talking about the particular importance of public rights litigation now, uh, civil rights litigation, uh, police misconduct litigation. Um, all of that because of, uh, as someone described it, agency capture. Those laws were enacted to allow private rights of action precisely because we didn't, even in those days, trust that the government would be an effective and efficient protector of rights. Now, those are the areas in which duck, avoid, and evade has been the most troubling, um, where uh, courts have narrow doctrines, restricted attorney's fees, thrown people out of court. And I think that that has to, pressure has to be put on that again. People have to write about that. People have to talk about it. I think that lawyers have to write op-eds. We have to translate this uh, uh, universe to the public in every way we can. My, uh, my initial uh, TV career is the beginning of a new chapter, I hope. Um, uh, but I do think that you have to deal with context. You also have to write op-eds to support the, the bench. One of the most frustrating things about being a judge for 17 years was that I could not speak except through what I did. And so to, and I did a fair amount of speaking even with that, but moving right along. Um, but but we, have, you, we have to rely on law students and lawyers and prof law professors to explain what's going on in the courts. Um, to translate that, particularly under this kind of assault. I think law schools have to change. Um, uh, law schools have to go back to first premises about why we had public rights litigation. My law clerks, who were fabulous, would typically tell me all the ways to get rid of these cases, all the ways to narrow habeas, all the ways, because that was what they had been taught. I think we have to go back to first premises about why we had habeas to begin with, why we needed civil rights laws, and then the relationship between these narrowing doctrines and that. So finally, I, I, it, it, the reason why these other efforts, op-eds, and changing the way we teach lawyers and law students are important, because the, the challenge here is not only what the president does, his enactments and um, his various executive orders can be formally challenged. What is frightening to me is what he has enabled. Um, what he has enabled, this morning I got an email from a judge who wanted to refer a case to me of a, of a disabled man who came into the US who, who couldn't speak. That was the nature of his disability. And he tried to write down what was going on and who he was. And he described uh, being essentially manhandled by immigration authorities until they finally realized that he couldn't speak. Um, and this was a judge who wanted me to find pro bono counsel or do it myself. So uh, this is a moment like none other. 
And I think we have to look at, I, I think that there's no one who can remain silent. I have, to, I have to sort of close with what was the mantra of my generation, uh, which was, uh, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I think that that affects every one of us. Walter, of course, no one knows the Washington legal scene uh, better than you, uh, and you've seen, obviously, huge challenges uh, before, too. Uh, when you graduated law school, it was the 1960s, a time where there was a lot of significant social and cultural disruption, as, uh, cultural disruption. and so what lessons would you offer for, say, a young law student or a lawyer who uh, is just coming out, either just coming out of law school or thinking about, you know, that five or ten years out of law school? How can they make a difference? Well, you know, the long perspective, uh, to pick up on what Nancy and Ted were saying, my long perspective goes back to the day I was born, May 15, 1941, in North Carolina. Um, that happened to be the day that Joe DiMaggio, who had gone hitless the day before, got a single in the bottom of the seventh. Unremarkable, except that he got another hit the next day and the day after that and the day after that, all through the summer of 1941, the greatest streak in the history of sports. But what was striking about the day I was born is that no person of color was permitted to play any major league sport. One third of Americans told the Gallup poll that they would support legal restrictions on Jews. Gay men and lesbians lived in constant fear of arrest, prosecution, and incarceration. And feminism was a word we did not even know when my widow mother tried to find a job with a high school education at that time. By the time I graduated uh, from the University of North Carolina in 1963, nothing had changed in both senses. The schools of the South were still segregated. African Americans were still almost entirely disenfranchised in the South. Women were barred from most professions. Major law firms would not hire Jews. Nothing had changed and everything had changed. Because there was this exhilarating feeling from my college years, 59 to 63, and into 63 to 6, an exhilarating feeling that we were, we were on the right side of history. We were on the right side of history. And the energy that came from that sense that though nothing had changed, everything would, was what I think gave us so much energy uh, and ambition. So my advice, we'll get into details later, my advice would be don't give up. Don't accept this. We've been through, we've been through times that were terrible. I think, as Ted said, this is perhaps the third existential moment in our history from the founding, the Civil War, and now, where I honestly believe democracy itself is at risk in all of our gains. But my, my principal lesson before we get into the details was take a lesson from what it was like to those who spoke out against the day in the 50s and 60s and kept their hopes alive that we would get through this. That's great. Um, I also want to remind all our audience members, if you have questions, we're going to be taking questions on little index cards. There are blank index cards on your tables. So if you just write out any questions you have, pass them to ACS staff who will walk around and collect the questions and then uh, pass them uh, to me. So just a uh, reminder uh, on that. Um, uh, Pollock, I wanted uh, to go to you and, and ask a little bit about, um, uh, about what you are doing and how the office that you're a part of uh, provides a kind of model for how people can go about meeting the moment. Um, the San Francisco City Attorney's Office, for those uh, who don't know, although if you were at the panel yesterday, you know, um, uh, for those who don't know, is one of the most uh, aggressive and effective um, uh, government entities out there fighting for equal access to justice, consumer rights, uh, and uh, civil rights more generally. Um, uh, all just won uh, a, a very nice injunction against the sanctuary cities uh, ban. Uh, and it's not just the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. The LA City Attorney's Office is a very aggressive, progressive advocate too, just uh, 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 responsible for the Wells Fargo case and was involved in the travel ban case too. Uh, and the thing I think about these positions is that I think for a lot of law students who came out of, for instance, my constitutional law class, um, <laughs> they're not thinking of a city attorney's position as a place to make progressive right. 
change. So tell us a little bit about, about what you're doing and about why that's a good model for how people can think about. There's a lot of different government positions out there that you can make really significant change if you see it, seize it, and exploit it. Thank you, um, Adam, and thank you, ECS. I just want to take a quick second to thank um, Kara for inviting me to speak on this panel. I have to admit my first thought was that means I have to stay through the end of the convention. Uh, no, but in, in all seriousness, um, I do want to thank ACS for just becoming a home for progressive lawyers and law students. Um, you <laughs> now more than ever, I love this family. Um, I, I remember coming to this convention nine years ago when we were at the Mayflower and I was up in the nosebleed section um, watching my first plenary and I didn't know anybody in the room. And I remember leaving thinking I had this sort of legal inspired high. And um, I remember legal, leaving thinking that I want to be a part of this organization and I want to become more involved with this organization. And I've since become an ACS evangelist. So, um, <laughs> so taking that to the San Francisco City Attorney's Office, as you mentioned, and for those of you that were in the room yesterday um, during the Progressive Federalism panel, Heather Gerken spoke of it as a nearly magical place where we get to sue almost anyone for almost anything, <laughs> stepping in the shoes of the California Attorney General and um, bringing cases on behalf of the people of California without a class certification or standing. And though that is a bit of an exaggeration, um, the, the California unfair competition law does give cities in California, LA, San Francisco, and a few others, the tool to bring cases against what we like to call bad actors that are practicing unlawfully, unfairly, or deceptively. And it allows cities to bring these cases on behalf of the entire state getting statewide relief. And as you just, as, as you just mentioned, our office did file suit um, the first lawsuit against this administration after Trump signed his executive order threatening to take federal funds from sanctuary cities. We filed six days after he signed that executive order and we have since received a nationwide preliminary injunction. But I have to say, um, that is just one example. That is just one incredible example of being a, a local army that, ha that works on local, largely local issues that have sometimes national import. Um, we also bring cases against predatory payday lenders and gun distributors and, I mean, really all of the bad actors. We bring cases against people claiming that they are immigration lawyers when in fact they are immigration consultants and deceptively target immigrants. Um, and that is the work that you, as law students in the room and young lawyers, can do when you're working and focused on your local community. And I recognize that not everyone is San Francisco and not everyone has the political latitude to kind of take some of these more cutting edge um, progressive cases, but I, this is, you know, when I, when I think, when I read the title for this panel, Meeting the Moment, in my mind I thought, this is why we went to law school. This was kind of the moment, and it's unfortunate that we have to live through it, but this is the time for us to actually find where we can be most effective, and I think the state and local government is that much more clearly a place where we can. Um, and if I could just say one more thing, you know, I, I, people go to law school for all different reasons, including politics. For those of them have been here for the last few days, I think we've heard from folks that have said, get in the game, you know, run for politics and things like that. Um, and I think that that's important. Um, and I think that one way to do that is not, is to um, work as a local lawyer, understand what it takes to, to, to govern and lead and be the counsel of a city or a state. Um, understand that you, what tools you can use to help problem solve for your city or your state. I mean, even the mother of dragons needed to conquer some cities far off before she could go sit on the Iron Throne. So, <laughs> so, um, 
So, and, and one last thing I want to say about the running for politics point. I, I, um, I went to the panel this morning and I was listening to Run for Lawyers. And um, I think her name is Amanda Lippman spoke and she's the new director of Run for Something. And she was looking at, out into the room and she was recommending that people find women, more women to run. And she did admit that she tweaked that language a little bit because usually when she gives that speech, she asks for diversity of professions to run, right? Not just lawyers. And so I think sometimes, you know, it's oftentimes that lawyers are leaders and that is important. But leaders are also not always lawyers. And so sometimes we need to find the people that are electable and can win and be the hand. Good. So speaking of, of, of running for office even, it's an important thing because I think we teach so many of our students, it goes right through the first year of law school, separation of law and politics. And we teach our lawyers to be lawyers and not necessarily politicians and, pol and to be engaged in politics. It's so important um, uh, to understand the role that politicians play in shaping that law and preserving that law. Uh, and so running for office is an important thing. And in fact, along those lines, Walter, if I can just go back to you for a quick sec. Didn't, wasn't there some story about um, when you were clerking for Justice White about the advice he gave you for when uh, you go off in the future? I, well, I was clerking. At the end of my clerkship with, with Hugo Black, I went down to see um, Justice White, who was most recently in politics of many of the justices. He had been head of Citizens for Kennedy in the 1960 election. And I said, I'm going to go back to North Carolina. I'm going to be teaching law at Duke. And I'd like to get involved in politics. What should I do? And he said, oh, you professors. I said, I'm not, I'm not there yet. He said, but you academic types. He said, you all want to write position papers. It used to drive me crazy when I was in Colorado politics. I need people to knock on doors. I need people to knock on doors. And I think, you know, the, the lessons I would draw from that, you know, and, and I feel guilty of myself, you need to work in local politics. You need to go back and pay attention to what's happening in local politics. For me, that was writing position papers in the Gantt Helms and, and Hunt Helms races, but I needed to be paying much more attention to what was going on in my state legislature. And if Chapel Hill or, or Bloomington are not the most effective place to work, because that's not where the, you know, the fulcrum is, drive, a, drive an hour away to some place in your state that is. I mean, I think that's what is, is critically important uh, to get out there and work. And I've pledged myself, because I've been thinking about this, to give money in my state legislative races and pay more attention at that level. Because that's what we've got to win it from the ground up. Um, Ian, let me let me uh, turn to you um, because you're so you're so you're working on rule of law issues, and I think that one of the things that um, really concerns so many people is the destruction of what it seems to be the rule of law uh, under this uh, current administration. Um, uh, we've seen the president call out uh, judges, um, uh, so-called judges, refer to their uh, ethnic background as if that were determining the, their uh, their decisions, called them political. Um, we're really seeing uh, really unprecedented uh, attacks, uh, but there are things we can do. Um, and, and how do we go about, do you think, really defending the, those, that, those principles and norms of the rule of law that are being uh, uh, challenged so many today? Even if those norms aren't written into binding law, how do we as lawyers and law students protect those norms almost as if they were law? Yeah. I, I wanna tie together something we started with that Ted said with where we've, I think, gotten to, which is, you know, I completely agree that we're facing this existential threat to American liberal democracy. It's why we started an organization called Protect Democracy. Um, but, you know, Ted said um, we, we can't believe, we can't accept that this is the end of the American Republic at the beginning of it, and he doesn't believe that's the case. Um, and I'm an optimist, so I'd like to think that's right. But um, I just had a newborn recently. Uh, he's four months old. Um, and so like any good progressive parents, we're reading him the Lorax and other <laughs> books like that. Um, and if you've read it recently, you'll remember you know, that, that at the end of the Lorax, they're looking at the one word that the Lorax mysteriously left behind, right? And it was the word unless. And they couldn't figure out what it meant. Um, and then the protagonist realizes what it means and, and offers the thought to, in this case, my son and other kids out here, which is that unless means we can't fix, in this case, the environment, in our case, our democracy, unless we can't make sure this isn't the end of the American Republic, unless people like us care a whole awful lot 
um, and do our part. I think this ballroom is the people who that unlasts is too, in every way that Pollock and, and Walter, and I think we all are gonna talk about. Um, so what do we do? Um, I think actually the tactics that we've been using for our organization are applicable to everybody in the room. Um, we've been deploying essentially four tactics. Um, the first one is public education, because an informed citizenry is an autocrat's worst enemy. Um, so the first thing we did in early March was we put out a memo for reporters and members of Congress on the arcane rules governing contacts between the White House and the Department of Justice and FBI. Well, it turned out that was a pretty prescient thing to educate reporters on back in early March. Um, but there's a whole slew of other norms like that that are not binding law um, and that are not actually that well known. But people in this room are familiar with them. So to Judge Nancy's point, we've got to get those norms out there. Um, we've got to remind people what they are. We've got to bang the drum on them day after day. Um, the second tactic is monitoring and exposing violations of them. Um, we've filed about 150, maybe 200 FOIA requests so far, and here's the great thing about it. I filed the first two of those um, from my couch before we started the organization just as me. And you can do that. It's pretty cool. You can just look online for any federal agency when you see something in the news that looks disturbing and file a FOIA request yourself. And if you're a law student or a young lawyer and you're looking for good litigation practice, you can actually litigate a FOIA case. You don't need a whole law firm to do that. Um, and there's far more FOIAs that we'd like to file than we have the capacity to do. So let's enlist this room in doing that to hold our government accountable. Um, the third tactic is inducing oversight, um, making sure that the oversight bodies uh, do their jobs. Now, some of them are reluctant to do that. So every time an organization like ours or ACS or you know, any of the organizations out there write to an oversight body and ask them to do something, echo it. Let's have the inspectors general hear from all of us when we ask them to look at the improper behavior in an agency. Let's have congressional committee chairs hear from all of us when we lead the way. Um, and then the last, the fourth step, of course, which we all are, are, are capable of doing is litigating. Um, and not just where there's existing clear judicial doctrine on the books. What we need to be doing today is we need to be thinking about what are the types of threats that we're seeing right now that our law does and should protect against, but maybe that doctrine hasn't been quite revealed yet. Um, when we see the president bully private citizens on Twitter um, and do real damage to people's reputation and standing in their communities, you know, this is something the founders were worried about. They were worried about an overweening federal government being too strong and coming down on an individual citizen. Um, that's what the Bill of Attainder Clause is all about. Um, so I think there's things out there that we all um, can be looking for that really are some hammers that we can use so that we can go to the courts when the other checks are failing. I mean, then I suppose there's sort of an asterisk last fifth thing, um, which is I think it's not inconceivable that in the next four years um, we could see the executive decide to ignore a court order um, and say that I'm not listening to the courts anymore. Um, and I think there we need to take lessons from places like Pakistan, right, where it was judges and lawyers who went out into the streets to protect the independence of the judiciary and rule of law. Um, since we launched this organization, we've been talking to a lot of scholars on democratic decline and the rise of autocracy in places like Hungary and Poland and Turkey. And one of the things they've all said to us is, when that happens in these countries, there's normally a moment where regular people kind of lick their finger and kind of see which way the wind is blowing. And if everybody's running to Dulles and JFK to protest, then they go too. But if everybody closes their door and pulls down their blinds, and doesn't say anything, that's kind of the death knell. So I think it's really up to us to make sure that we're the ones who are running to JFK and Dulles, because if we do that, then I agree with what Ted said. Um, but if we don't, you know, So I, I, I wanted to add that, um, uh, I want to say something on the collective level. I agree with everything you just said, and you know, here, here. Um, but we have to work on the collective level, as you're talking about, and on the individual level. So this is self-serving, but I just want to share this story because I think it, it uh, illustrates what I'm talking about. Some years ago, I was, when I was living in New York, I grew up in New York, and I was on the subway. I got on the subway, and I walked into the subway car, and something was happening. And I didn't quite understand what it was at first, but there were three or four people who were screaming at two men who were obviously because of their dress and appearance, Orthodox Jews. And they were yelling at them and they were screaming things like, you stink, and they were 
yelling obscenities, and nobody was saying anything on the subway. And um, I thought to myself, what do these men think right now? Do they think that everybody agrees and that's why they're silent or they're intimidated? You have to say something. But I didn't know what to say, so all I could think of, and I've told this story before, but all I could think of saying was, shame on you. Which seemed at the moment very lame, but it was all I could think of. <laughs> shame on you. And they turned toward me and they cussed me. And, uh, and, um, uh, but the point is this. Uh, in the moment, right in the moment, in this moment, we individually and collectively have to speak against this threat to our democracy. We have to think, uh, we have to speak against the, the hatred and the bias and the prejudice and the violence and um, not only speak but act against it immediately. Uh, because this is a time that as we are all agreeing is different. So that's one thing I wanted to say. I wanted to just add also that um, I think we have to name what is happening. You know, the emperor has no clothes. And uh, I, for one, have come to say that we have a man in the White House, as frightening as it is to, to name it, who is both emotionally and mentally, in my view, unstable. Uh, and I think we have to call it for what it is. <laughs> Some people are beginning to say that, and you say, well, what do you do about that? Well. You know, obviously there are constitutional provisions that may or may not eventually come into play. But the starting place is to name it. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to do that. Um, and then um, I, I just think we ought to be saying what is obviously true. Uh, this is a man who occupies the office of the presidency who doesn't understand what a fourth grader would understand about how our government operates. He has no business being in this office for all kinds of reasons. Um, he wouldn't know the Constitution, uh, Mr. Khan, if he chipped over it. Uh, but because of that, he's stomping all over it, mm -hmm. or is poised to do so. And if anyone is going to speak to that, it's the people in this room. Uh, Although I, I, I keep praying, and I'm in North Carolina, so Lord knows I'm praying hard about it. <laughs> I'm praying that uh, people in the Republican Party and conservatives in general, that they begin to put country above party. Um, we need that so badly. You know, I, uh, Ted, calls to our conscience that we have to, we have to begin by being willing to name things. And I think that, you know, we often say you can't know what's in the hearts of men and women, but I also think racism is as racism does. And when you want to bring back mass incarceration, which has been thoroughly repudiated, to incarcerate another generation of a large measure of another generation of young black men, when you want to remove federal ju uh, justice scrutiny of what's preying on communities in Ferguson, Chicago, and other places, when you want to bring back private prisons which prey upon the vulnerable, making money by cheap food and cheap medical care and, and lengthen lengthening sentences by finding infractions, when you do all those things, you're a racist, and the Attorney General of the United States is a racist. I just wanted to pick up also on, on one thing that Ted said at the end, which is that a lot of these issues that we're talking about, these rule of law issues, they bridge the divide between liberals and conservatives. Um, it's hard to make a mass appeal to conservative lawyers. Um, but I would imagine that most everyone in this room probably has a friend in the Federalist Society or a friend who you deliberate and debate with is on the conservative side, and you have that personal relationship. And 
to the extent that each of us can reach out across the aisle to conservative lawyers who you know, have taken their oath and are members of the bar and really help them see the ways in which the rule of law itself is being attacked. And even just jointly as two people, right, sending a letter to your senator saying, we don't agree on much, right? One of us is a progressive, one of us is a conservative, but we do agree on this. Now, 600 lawyers in Georgia sent a letter to two senators there um, talking about needing the senators there to stand up against these attacks on judges. That's something that each of us could do just as two of us with one of our friends. I think it would be really meaningful if we all did that to help conservatives remember, especially conservative lawyers, our obligations as members of this profession. Mm. Now, with... Well, I just, I also, I do want to think about what the point is that is too much. In other words, I do want to think about uh, uh, about mobilizing people to consider what impeachment would look like, what you know, identifying the president's disability would look like. And since that is obviously a political judgment, how do you mobilize the po politics, not just who's the Republican votes, but how do you mobilize the polity, the people, to understand uh, that, that this is a president who has crossed the line, is about to cross the line in other areas, and a president who is disabled. I, I keep on getting back to the media. I keep on wanting to turn on the television after some speech that the president has given and see Anderson Cooper or whomever turn to the camera and go, this president is batshit crazy. <laughs> The problem is that once they say that, they have nothing else to say. And that's the problem. And then you spend three or four hours legitimate, you know, dealing with the things that the president has said as if it were legitimate policy, and it was not meant to be that, and it shouldn't be engaged with at all. So I do want to talk about what's the point at which we really regularly talk about impeachment and we regularly talk about disability and how to mobilize people because the dynamics of the press are just the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it raises a, a larger question that I just pose for any of the panelists who want to jump in is, is how do we prioritize? Um, there are, like we said, there's so many issues that are arising. There's so many uh, different challenges that we're facing uh, on so many different fronts. Um, how, how, do, how do we prioritize? How do we keep our focus rather than be distracted by whatever comes up uh, on the, the daily news right, today? Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, I, I don't have the answer to how we prioritize, but I do think that we have to realize how we got here. And a part of it is that no matter how we prioritize, we can't do a lot right now. And we're not in a position to do it a lot right now. We have to focus on what went wrong and why we're here. And I think a part of that is that it's clear to all of us that are in this room that it's incumbent on us to carry these messages out of this room and to our communities and get them to care, get them to care about the courts, get them to care about these issues and the rule of law and defending it in the Constitution. And my question is actually whether we think we're being effective. And I challenge us to admit that we're not being as effective as we need to be. And I'm gonna bring in a term that everybody in the Bay Area likes to throw around in the tech industry, which is disruptive. And I know that us lawyers, and especially us regulators, shy away from being disruptive. But I think we have to rethink how we communicate these issues to the larger progressive community that are non-lawyers, that can understand it, that I, that I truly believe will care about it if they understood what they could do to care about it, sending these letters, um, reaching out, caring about who your local judges are. And I, the good thing right now is that, you know, there's a high demand for that knowledge, actually, in the larger progressive community. And as the young kids say, people are woke. And, and, and I think we should, we as lawyers should wear that hat, not just within this, within this community that we have here, but largely outside of it. And I think when you ask about prioritizing, there's so many individual issues that those of us here and advocates outside of this room and here work on. And it's hard to know which ones we need to prioritize, although I'm sure my panelists will have a better list. I think we have to start by addressing how do we prioritize working on the moment with all the rest of our lives? <laughs> and I'm, I'm struck by the recollection of an exchange between Abigail Adams and, and John Adams during that revolutionary moment when she wrote to him and said, he was in Paris, 
you're, you're never going to museums, you're not looking at the, the sculpture. Why do you men spend all your time thinking about politics? And he wrote back and said, we mu and this is a paraphrase, but it's close, we must think about and study war, politics, and government so that our sons may study commerce and science and math so that our grandsons and granddaughters may study art and literature and music. That's but at this moment, you know, we have to turn our attention to politics. To be practical, I think the 2018 House races are essential for a progressive America, just to be concrete. Secondly, I think state legislative races that are going to affect redistricting, where we have to battle against gerrymandered odds to get something back, to have something like a level playing field. And then to me, the single most important longer range, looking ahead to 2020, is we've got to figure out how to have a fair presidential election with this man in the White House and in control of all the machinery of government in the year 2020. That's my list. Any other thoughts on prioritization? Because I do think it's an issue so many of us are struggling with. Well, I was thinking that it's, it's, it's a real challenge to prioritize. I listen to the news, I watch the news, I read the news, and I see that the president says something about what's going on in the Middle East, which uh, reflects a total absence of the beginning of any understanding about uh, how governments operate, um, about diplomacy, uh, about how to uh, uh, interact with other countries and their leaders. Uh, and I think to myself how dangerous that is and where it could lead. Uh, maybe that's not something that I, as a law professor or you know, a civil rights lawyer, uh, would find a lot of purchase in if I was to begin to talk about that. There are other people with more expertise. Uh, but I do think about what expertise we all have in this room and what we do know is law and government and how it ought to operate. And there's so much that Donald Trump puts out there and his people, my Lord, <laughs> uh, that you know, they put out there that is just flat out wrong and dangerous. And I don't think we're doing enough to call them on it. The media, I mean, they're doing their job and we need to protect them to the extent that we can be helpful in doing that. But they also are very intent on showing that they're walking down a middle path. Somebody needs to be saying that this is just not true, it's not right. I mean, the media does that sometimes, but I think that we have to be calling him on how government works. He, he came into the White House without any understanding or any intention to work with Congress. You know, he thinks he's the Lone Ranger. Um, and I think that we have to constantly, through op-eds, through um, speaking opportunities and writing through litigation and cases, we have to constantly um, keep pulling the country back to its moorings in terms of how we operate and what democracy is and what this republic is. I'm not articulating this well enough, but I know what I mean. <laughs> one, one other issue for law students. Not everyone can do politics, and not everyone can write the perfect op-ed, but in addition to what we were talking about, about going to states, uh, city solicitor general's offices, one of the things that's extraordinary to me, that you, the law students should be going to the state courts. Uh, there are state supreme courts, Massachusetts is one of them, that, have, that are interesting and creative and have their own constitutions, which frankly, over the years, have been a bulwark to changes in the US Constitution. And, Law students should be clerking for trial judges 
in those states and for uh, appellate judges in those states. The state systems, first of all, are where people come up the ranks to the federal courts, but also that's the where, where change is going to be made and where, to some degree, the resistance may have to be. Um, a question from the audience is, is, is there a worry that there's too much focus on Trump and not enough focus on the larger structural issues that, um, that people who support liberal democratic values should be focused on, the concentration of wealth, um, uh, the lack of civic engagement uh, among uh, the people, uh, lack of excitement about voting, uh, too much money in politics, these kinds of issues. Um, while we're starting to focus on emoluments and conflicts of interest and government ethics, um, how do we keep fighting for those other issues as well so that you know, Trump's, Trump, Trump's administration will, I hope, one day end? I say I hope. Um, yeah, that will, but, but how do we go back? We, I mean, there are big issues that we needed, to, we needed to be working on long before Donald Trump was elected. Um, how do we think about those issues in light of the Trump administration and the Trump years? I think right now we're in a rear guard moment. Right? It's going to be very hard to do things like reform campaign finance laws or address stru structural inequality with the current government that we have. Um, if you talk to the people who've looked at democratic decline, there's no question that those issues do lead to democratic decline. They are the precursors of it, but we're not going to be able to fix them with Donald Trump and the presidency. So right now, I think we are in a protection moment. Um, and once we get past that protection moment, once the administration ends, then we immediately need to turn to fixing these underlying things. And, and one thing that I think is critical for this protection moment is the, the Russian dissident Masha Gessen, who's written a lot about her experiences in Russia, says one thing that we all need to do in this moment that we're in, this goes to Judge Nancy's point about what the red lines are, is write down right now, hello, write down right, right now what are the limits? What are the red lines that we just cannot afford to cross? Because we are in danger of the frog in boiling water problem, where things start to drift so much that we may not notice it happening. I mean, if I had told you a year ago that the President of the United States was going to fire the FBI director for looking into him and brag about it to the Russians while giving away classified intelligence to the Oval Office, <laughs> you'd say I was an alarmist and I was crazy. Right. But today, you'd say, yeah, and look what they did this morning, right? And, right. and so this stuff is getting normalized, and we need to write down and prevent it from getting normalized so we can survive this moment, so we can turn to these other things. Right. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't have written this. Uh, a novelist couldn't have written what has happened uh, with respect to the election, with respect to the, the stolen Supreme Court seat. Um, you know, you just couldn't, and, and this man who's in the White House, and so, that's right, but we're also, you're right, we're in a defensive mode. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, this week, as we know, while all eyes were focused on Comey's testimony on Thursday, we also know what was going on with respect to Dodd-Frank mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the beginning of another move on uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, you know, go on and on. So there is this agenda that's being pursued by this Congress who have made, a, I think, uh, an unholy deal um, with uh, the president uh, because they think that they can use his presidency somehow. Um, uh, so even though some of them may not like him or be comfortable with him, and it's not about whether you like him or not, but um, you know, what we're seeing is uh, you know, this Congress isn't gonna stop him. They aren't gonna impeach him. I don't think they are unless something else Another shoe drop. Uh, right, uh, and, and other shoes will drop. Yep. Uh, but, it's uh, a centipede. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that, yes, they're pursuing a, another agenda. I thought in, right before November, one night, I couldn't sleep. I woke up and I started, I was so excited. I started writing down the list of Supreme Court precedents that we could go after <laughs> with a new court. You know, and, and we had this conversation, Walter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thought about the possibilities. We were that close right. to changing everything that we've known for the last 40 or so years with respect to the courts. Well, that's not gonna happen now. Um, at least not in this time. Um, and so we are fighting a defensive fight. We have no choice. 
Okay, so um, I, I just wanted to say, I know that this panel was included um, last minute largely to end on an uplifting no so that we can all go back to our respective places. It's hard, and I think actually prioritizing finding the silver lining is probably the only way we're gonna be able to sustain ourselves over the next however many years. Um, but I do wanna encourage everybody here to, to remember that um, you know, we have to keep resisting and persisting and organizing. We have to keep doing things both with our lawyer hat as well as our lawyer hat in our non-legal community. Um, I think, Adam, in your last question, you, you asked this question, um, you know, what, what can we do to increase civic engage, engagement? Yes, there's Trump, but what could we have done? Some part of me thinks that we have to be strategic in taking this time to listen. And I think that we weren't doing that as well as we thought we were potentially. And we need to listen to people and connect with people in a way that potentially is the reason why we didn't win this election. Um, and, and I think that that starts now. And I know for a, a quick example of that is that, you know, the day after inauguration, I uh, marched along with many, many of you, I'm sure, in the Women's March. And I was marching with a woman that's not a lawyer. And the entire time she was just kind of venting about what can I do in this moment? I'm a doctor, all I do is donate to advocacy organizations. I have no, I've, I don't have enough information and I don't, I'm not, I'm not engaged enough to know what I can do. And in that moment, I took off my lawyer hat and I put on my ACS hat. And I thought, I know what we can do. We can, we can program on a local level and, and bring in people to talk about topical issues to non-lawyers. We call ourselves PMS. Um, and it stands for the Post March Salon. And we literally meet the same time of the month every month. <laughs> And, um, and these women have gone on and they are so excited and they're emailing me all sorts of ideas and we're, you know, we're working on local issues like San Francisco homelessness, we're donating to campaigns, Virginia and Atlanta. And I just think when you guys leave here, no matter what you're doing as your professional life, we're all curious. We all went to law school for a reason. This is the moment that we went to law school for. I can't emphasize that enough. Can I just add one other thing? Um, uh, so we're running out of time uh, very quickly. In fact, we've run out of time already. So, um, but let me just say that in terms of the inspiring people, um, people, are, you know, you're often looking for some takeaway. I think there's a lot of takeaways from this conversation. If you want something to do, to do some direct action, we've heard about filing lawsuits or a pro bono case or filing FOIA requests. We've talked about running for office. We've talked about organizing with your friends and your colleagues to amplify your voice and to get other people involved. Uh, you know, we've talked about finding government offices that maybe are not well being used to pursue progressive values and, and try to do that. Uh, I'd like to make a, an ask of every single person in this room. There's several hundred people here. If every one of you, by the time we meet here again next year, writes an op-ed and publishes it in your local paper or your local school newspaper, or it doesn't have to be high profile, and if it's in the heartland, all the better. We don't need another op-ed in the New York Times. Be, amplify your voice, make your voice heard. Uh, and then just for a final thought, I'd like to just turn it over uh, to Walter. Uh, I was realizing that my younger son, Drew, who is a poet and activist and educator, uh, 15 years ago, uh, wrote a poem called Styroglyph uh, Hieroglyphic, Stair Hieroglyphic Stairway, uh, and uh, a brief excerpt. Uh, is for the moment. It's 3.23 in the morning and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the season started failing as the mammals, reptiles, birds were dying. Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? My great-great-grandchildren asked me in dreams, what did you do once you knew? Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. You all.